Welcome to our talk about model-based testing with TLA Plus and Appalachia. This is a joint work of Igor Konov and myself, and we both are proud to be members of Informal Systems, where Igor Konov is a principal scientist, developing next-generation verification methods. He is also the leading developer of the Appalachia Model Checker. And I am a research engineer at Informal, who also contributes to Appalachia and, the, and leads the product on model-based testing. We're using Rust and formal verification tools to build open source, fault tolerant distributed systems like the Tendermint Byzantine Fault Tolerant Consensus Engine and the Inner Blockchain Communication Protocol. We're cooperatively owned and governed by our employees, and we have offices in Toronto, Berlin, Vienna, and Lausanne. In fact, a few other folks at Informal would love to say hello. Hello. Hello, world. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hey, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hey everyone. You can learn more about us, check out our work, and contribute online at github.com slash informal systems. We hope you enjoy the conference. Who we are? At Informal Systems, we envision uh, the bright future of verifiable distributed systems and organizations. Nowadays, everything becomes distributed. And uh, at the same time, when we interact with systems and organizations, we need a certain level of trust. Our grand vision is that formal verification can help us to bring this necessary level of trust to the systems and organizations with, which, with whom we interact. We actively contribute to this vision by developing the next generation blockchain infrastructure, nam namely the Tendermint blockchain consensus protocol, and the inter-blockchain communication protocols. Our formal verification portfolio consists of the Apache model checker, one of the leading model checkers for TLA+. And we also contribute to this verifiable organization's vision with the Themis contract tool. Our infrastructure power is the Cosmos network. And the Cosmos network is the dream vision of the next generation internet of blockchains, where each blockchain can operate independently. At the same time, these blockchains can interact and trust each other. How do we achieve this trust? We propose the verification-driven development framework. We have applied this framework to our own products, namely to the Tendermint family of protocols. We have developed English and TLA plus specifications of these protocols, model check them with Appalachia. This has helped us to fix some protocol issues, but the most importantly, it helped to clarify the protocol understanding, the mutual protocol understanding between the research and the development teams. What's not so nice about this is that we have realized that after we start to develop code, the code starts to diverge from the specifications. You see that the necessary feedback loop is missing here. And the way we propose to address this issue is by model-based testing. In model-based testing, we generate integration tests from simple TLA plus assertions. This helps us to eliminate this divergence between the spec and the code. They now evolve in sync. And this significantly improves ease of writing and using the tests. Also, it improves the test maintainability and helps us to achieve higher code coverage. This is a teaser of our model-based testing process, but before diving into it, Igor will tell you more about the Tendermint protocol, the Lightline protocol, and the Apalache model check. Hey, my name is Igor Konov. I'm a principal researcher at Informal Systems. And I'll give you a brief introduction into Tendermint Light Client, how we specify it in CLA Plus. And I'll give you an introduction in the model checking results with Apalachia. And then Andrei Kupriyanov will continue the talk with model based testing. So let's have a look at uh, Tendermint blockchain. What is that? That's a sequence of blocks, and every block has a certain structure. So there are interesting uh, fields here. One of them is a validator set. This is a set of computers that are going to vote on this block. And when more than two thirds of them uh, 
voted on the block, this block is going to be added on the blockchain. So there is an algorithm which is called Tendrum in consensus, and all of these validators are running this algorithm. So what these uh, validators are deciding on, they decide on the uh, on the contents of this block, say application uh, uh, state in this block. They also decide on who the next validators are going to be. And uh, when they have decided that, uh, the validators change, the set of validators may change. When this uh, block has been committed, uh, there is uh, another record that is formed uh, in the next block, which is called last commit. This record contains the votes of the validators from the previous block and the hash that is po pointing to previous block. So if you are running Tendermin consensus as a validator, you can uh, make sure that your transactions that you have submitted on the blockchain, uh, you can figure out whether they have been committed or not. But what happens if you just have a smartphone, you cannot run Tendermint consensus on it, it's just too expensive and you don't want to invest uh, a lot of money into running the validator. So that is the question uh, the light client is solving. So in the light client, you have some trusted block, say block one, and it's, it doesn't matter how you figure it out whether to trust it or not, but you know you can trust it. And then you want to download another block that is far on the blockchain. You cannot trust anyone. You cannot trust the peers that give you the blocks, right? You have to use some knowledge about this blockchain to figure out whether you can trust the block. What can you do? The obvious solution would be, say, if you want to download block nine, the obvious solution would be to download the whole blockchain, check all the digital signatures, check how many validators have voted for each block, and so on and so forth. But that's too expensive, especially if you do it on a mobile phone. Fortunately, we can do what is called uh, skipping verification. And it's using uh, the knowledge about how this consensus is working. First of all, there is one interesting observation here. If I know that my block uh, was committed by a set of validators, and more than one third of these validators, if they were validators in the trusted block, then I know that at least one of the validators can be trusted because we have less than one third of faulty validators in our system. So that's basically the idea. If you find uh, a pair of blocks such that you can establish this root of trust, you can uh, trust a new block and then uh, do bisection again and find these pairs of blocks uh, that can establish the trust. So basically, skip verification is doing some form of bisection. There is one complication, though. Uh, first of all, I have to make sure that more than one third of validators has voted. And second, I have to know something about time. Because in Tendermint, you don't uh, put your money on at stake forever, you put it for some time, which is called unbonding period. If I'm running a validator for, say, block one, it means that I have uh, I have staked some money, and this money is going to be lost if I do something wrong on the blockchain. That's why it's not sufficient just to check how many validators have voted. You also have to figure out that all these validators are still within what is called uh, the trusting period. So you have to find that more than one third of validators have, has voted and your time is still within the trusting period of those validators who have voted on the trusted block. As we have seen, Tendermin consensus, um, the assumptions about blo the blockchain, and the light client protocol, they're not simple. That's why we have decided to formalize all these assumptions in TLA plus and check them with a model check. But before we actually sat down and wrote a TLA plus specification, we wrote another document which we call an English specification. That's how we do things at informal systems now. We uh, write this document. It's a mixture of English prose and mathematics. It contains uh, the sequential statement about the problem we are going to solve, 
it contains uh, a decomposition of this problem into distributed components. It also has um, basic uh, specifications uh, of the temporal properties we believe this protocol should satisfy. And it has uh, the high level functions, the pre conditions, the post conditions, and more importantly, the error conditions uh, that tell us what has to happen if some assumptions about our system are violated. We use this document uh, as a base for discussions between the distributed system engineers, verification engineers, and researchers before we start diving into a formal specification such as one and two plus. I'm not going to give you this document here, but uh, you can find it on the web. Here's a link, uh, and you can see uh, how one can. Uh, understand uh, this light client protocol without knowing zero plus. Once uh, this document is ready, we sit down and write the specification in zero plus. In the case of light client, it actually took us uh, several hours to translate the English specification into actual zero plus that we could uh, check with Appalachia. What we focus on uh, in the CLA plus specification, we focus on the model of the blockchain that I briefly explained to you before. This model captures these notions of validator sets, designs and faults, and the time assumptions that we have in Tendermint consensus. And we have a specification of the light client protocol in CLA+. Uh, in our case, uh, the light client protocol is talking to a peer. We know whether this uh, peer is correct or faulty, and it also has some uh, time uh, that it relates to, to the blockchain. Again, I'm not giving you the TLA specification, you can find it on the web, but I want to give you a bit of uh, flavor about this specification. So first of all, uh, the light client can talk to either a faulty peer or a correct peer. The light client, of course, cannot know whether the peer is faulty or not, but he set up a parameter in the specification that is telling us whether the peer is faulty or not. If the peer is correct, we just copy a block from the blockchain and give it to the light client. If the peer is faulty, we produce a non-terministically block that passes some basic uh, validation tests, but it might have uh, the incorrect set of validators or it may, it may have an incorrect set of commits, it may have some skewed time, and so on and so forth. I just want to show you here the structure of the blocks that we have, because that might be interesting. Um, so blocks uh, are basically records in CLA. They have the height, the time, which is just an integer in our encoding. They have uh, a set uh, of commits. These are the validators who have voted on the previous block, they have the set of validators for the current block, and they have the set of uh, validators for the next block. When uh, a client is receiving a light block, it gets this header plus the set of commits who must have voted on that header. And if you think about uh, checking this uh, data structure, you still see, imagine you have a sequence of blocks like that, you can see that uh, there is a lot of space for state explosion here. You have integer time, and you have four sets of validators. That's why we are using Apollo. Again, I'm not giving you details, uh, all the details here, but basically, uh, before we run the light client, we initialize the blockchain with just in one step. And uh, the way we initialize it, we just guess the validator sets, the sets of commits, and timestamps. So they form actually a correct blockchain where, the, where more than two thirds of validators have voted. The commits are also correct and not corrupted, and timestamps are growing monotonically. Let's see how we can verify the TLA specification of the light client with our model checker Apalachia. If you haven't ever seen this tool before, you can go on that web page that's mentioned above, read the manual, and see uh, for yourself how the tool 
is working. From the bird's eye perspective, what it does, it takes a TLA specification, it unfolds all the operator definitions, including the recursive operator definitions up to certain bounds. It finds what we call uh, assignments, uh, similar to what TLC does uh, dynamically. It decomposes a specification into smaller pieces that we call symbolic transitions, they roughly correspond to actions in your specification. Then it does some simple type checking, although what it does now is going to be superseded by the new type checker and type infer you will heard about at this meeting as well. And then it does a translation of a TLA specification into an SMT formula. As you probably know, SMT solvers are quite powerful and we want to utilize the power for verification questions in TLA+. What Apalachi does uh, in a bit more detail, it actually performs bounded mode checking. Uh, given a specification in the following canonical form that TLC also expects, uh, it first, uh, Apalachi first uh, checks whether uh, the invariant can be validated in the initial state, translates this formula into SMT, and tasks the SMT solver if it can find a satisfying assignment for this query. If it has found a satisfying assignment, Apalachi will produce a counterexample in CLA form. Otherwise, it will continue to unroll the executions. It will introduce one step, two steps, three steps until it has either found a counterexample with SMT or it has reached a certain depth. That's why it's called bounded mode checking. Fortunately for the light client specification, we even can provide a depth given the length of the blockchain. We ran Apalachi on different models uh, produced from the light client specification. There we had uh, from four to seven validators and from uh, three to five uh, blocks in the, in the blockchain. Also we had uh, either faulty or correct peers the light client uh, was talking to. These are not huge numbers, however, uh, recall that we had uh, all these uh, power sets in the blockchains and uh, tricky relations, including cardinality comparisons. We also have found some violations of the properties, which is interesting because uh, these violations were predicted by our researchers. And I just want to show you how Apalachi runs. Uh, without any compilation or whatever, you can just pull the tool from Docker. It will it will pull a Docker image. In my case, it just uh, it's fresh, so it doesn't do anything. And then I run uh, the Docker image. I run Apalachi in the Docker image. I ask it to check this invariant and give it a model of five validators and five blocks. What Apalachi does now inside the Docker image, it does the preprocessing I told you about, and then it checks the invariant for the initial state, for uh, the states, all possible states after one step, after two steps, after three steps, and soon it's going to report a counterexample. Yeah, so here's a counterexample. You can go to counterexample.cla and see the exact values produced uh, by Apalachi and Z3 that violate uh, this specific invariant. Now I give the floor to Andrei. Now we continue with the model-based testing, but before diving into it, I want to describe shortly how standard testing looked for us before. A test engineer was using the Tendermint in Go implementation to manually write integration tests that were then run against both Tendermint and Rust and Tendermint and Go implementations. This is an example of a pretty simple uh, manually written integration test. It just constructs a test case, which is a sequence of, of steps for the light client protocol. Then this test case is translated into the JSON encoding for all the necessary data structures, which contain such details and as public keys and hashes. And is executed uh, by the static driver. And this static driver is a pretty simple piece of code, which just takes this test case 
execute the light plane verifier and compare the verdict that it returns at each step with the verdict that's expected from the test. Standard testing has a number of drawbacks. First of all, it's manual generation. It's a lot of effort. Uh, this test that we saw was pretty simple, actually. In more complicated cases, it's non-trivial logic required, and it's inflexible. It fixes all the parameters. Non-determinism non left for exploration. It's also hard to understand what a particular test case does. It's hard to maintain them. And it's hard to cover all the cases because we, we need hundreds of those tests. That's why we switched to Moodle-based testing. And now we will look at its components. But before looking at, at it in particular, we will we'll run a short demo. This is a short demo of how our model-based testing is working. It's fully integrated into the standard cargo test command. As, as, as a test. So when we run this cargo test command, what happens? Uh, for each of the TLA plus tests, in, in this case, a test success, it runs Appalachia on this test. Appalachia produces uh, a counter example, which contains the example execution. This execution is then translated into the static test. And this test is, is run against the implementation. In this case, we have the light client protocol and we execute this light client protocol against the static test and compare the verdict that it we obtain against the expected verdict. What we can see in this case is that running Appalachia does take some time, but as a byproduct of those uh, model-based tests, we obtain the static tests, and this static test can then be executed independently in almost no time. Now, how does a TLA plus test look like? TLA plus test is a pretty simple TLA plus assertion. Uh, you see, it's very easy to understand for each particular test what it does. I, I very much like, for example, this test. It test it, this test says that for each state in the computational history, the validator sets should be different. You can also express assertions about time, for example, or about the final final state of the protocol. How do we integrate these tests with the light client model you saw before? This is also very easy due to the modular nature of the TLA plus language. We simply extend the init and next predicates with the history tracking. So we introduce this additional history variable, and this variable just tracks the necessary state components of the light client protocol. And at each step of the model execution, besides executing the model itself, we are also updating the history for the next state. For the model checker, we needed only to extend it with JSON input-output support for integration purposes. In fact, you can now use Appalachia as a translator between TLA plus and JSON, and we highly encourage everyone interested to use this feature. You could use it, for example, to integrate TLA plus with your tools. Now, how counterexample looks like? A counterexample is a sequence of history states. At, at each state of this history, we have the current block, the current time point, the verdict that we expect from the light client, and the latest verified block. And this is how a small portion of this, of this history is translated into JSON. Don't be scared by the large size of the encoding. This is meant only for automatic processing. Now, as a next step, we transform our counterexample with the help of another component, which, which is called JSONATOR, into the static integration test. And this transformation happens with the help of so-called transformation specification, which is a small domain-specific uh, domain language, which describes how to transform one JSON into another JSON. An important 
part of this translation is that it calls so-called tendermint test gen command, which allows us to produce full tendermint data structures from the abstract data data structures that we have in the TLA plus mode. Let's take a look how test gen works. In the effectively you can see it as a probe into the concrete implementation space from the abstract TLA plus space. For example, in the abstract space a validator is a simple string identifier. In the concrete implementation space it contains private and public keys and additional details. A header in the abstract space just lists all, 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 all uh, simple abstract details, like the validator set, the next validator set, the height, the time, and the last commit. And this translates into a fully fledged data structure with all the necessary hashes. Now to the results. One of the most important results about model based testing is, from my point of view, that it helped to eliminate the divergence between the spec and the code. So each each uh, case that you see here results from uh, a failing model-based test. For example, it was able to catch such corner cases as the difference between less and less than or equal. In this particular case, uh, the specification, the TLA plus specification, actually diverged from both from the English specification and from the source code. In another cases, uh, we added, for example, additional check, uh, additional condition to the specification because it was generating negative times because it was simply integers. And then another corner case between less than or equal and less. And what it was also missing another check in the specification that the headers are not coming from the future. Model-based testing helped us to substantially improve the code coverage, as you can see, for the relevant parts of the source tree. And it already helped us to find the real bug, although this is only the first iteration. Recently, we have updated the Tendermint protocol from version 0.33 to version 0.34, and the validator set ordering changed between the version. An important aspect here is that this bug was missed both by the standard testing and it was also not properly documented in the specifications of the protocol, but it was caught by, by the model-based test. It was a pretty simple fix, as you can see here. Now, to conclude, uh, model-based testing substantially improves ease of writing and, and using the tests. It's much easier to maintain them and it improves the code coverage. The most important aspect, I think, is that it makes the specifications live. Now, the specification evolves continuously with the code that it specifies. And although we have invested some time into infrastructure, I think the benefits substantially outweigh those investments. As a future work, currently we are working on adding fuzzing to model-based testing. Under Fizen, we understand additional mutation on the level of data structures. And this allows us to cover scenarios which are currently inexpressible in the abstract model. For example, in the abstract model, a validator set is a mathematical set. So it can't contain two identical validators. At the same time, for the source code, you want to test such cases. We plan to add extensions to the Apalachian model checker for faster counterexample search because counterexamples can be found using specialized techniques. Currently, Apalachian is more targeted towards uh, invariant checking. We plan to generate executable code from TLA plus specifications. And this means just resolving all non-determinism that is present in the, in the TLA plus. This will allow us to substantially speed up testing. And we plan to extend the model-based testing framework to distributed setting, where we will cut the system at the interface points and replace some of the models with executable specifications. And in that way, we will test a mixture of the specs and the real code in the running system. Thank you for your attention.